Hello, friends. This is the Neatarts Friends Church podcast. We are Jesus people, kingdom of God people, welcoming, yearning, sharing. And we're glad you're connecting here with us. We'd love to connect in person as well. If you're inclined to support this podcast or for more information, just hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. That's neatartsfriends.org. Let's jump into today's sermon. A tale of two daughters. A tale of 12 years. This is, by the way, one of my favorite gospel stories. Luke chapter 8, verse 40 through 53. Now when Jesus returned... A crowd welcomed him. He's coming back from Decapolis, by the way. They welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue ruler, or president, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about twelve, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, Someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Just have faith. And she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Two daughters. Jesus was roughly 18 or 19 years old when the first daughter was born. And Jesus was roughly 18 or 19 years old when the second daughter began hemorrhaging, bleeding nonstop. Twelve years later, two daughters' lives hung in the balance. But the past 12 years for these two daughters' lives could hardly have been more different. If I had to describe the first daughter with only a few words, I would choose the words golden child. The first daughter was the only child of perhaps the most esteemed man in the entire community. Her father was the president or ruler of the local synagogue, a position that held the highest status within local communities. Synagogues in that time functioned as the center for all community life. The synagogue was where Jewish boys spent until the age of 10 learning the written law and then moved on to learn the oral law, which later came to be known as the Mishnah. The synagogue functioned as the local court the local treasury, the archive storage location, the local school, the center for education, the local house of prayer and worship, the center of teaching Jewish tradition and identity. Jairus likely held the role of upholding the local vision, 
how the Jewish tradition should be lived out. Here was a father who was well known, prominent in the community, distinguished, well thought of, and honored. Talk about a prestigious family with a home, with money, connections, friends. And here was a girl at the peak of life. Within Jewish society, she was on the cusp of marriageability. Within the world of arranged marriages, if there was any girl in the community that other parents wanted to arrange for their son to marry, it would have been this girl. She would have been considered quite the catch. For 12 years, this girl had been celebrating every Jewish festival, every feast, holiday, with her family and friends and community. A life of connection, joy, stability. But life in the ancient world had a way of turning quite quickly. Disease and illness abounded. Life expectancy rates were very different than they are today. Scholars tell us that roughly 60% of teenagers in ancient Palestine died by their mid-teens. We don't know what this girl's illness was, but simply that her parents were desperate. Jairus fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter was dying. Had this 12-year-old girl ever met Jesus before? Had she seen Jesus across the way at a synagogue or heard of Jesus? Perhaps the only thing she had in common with the second daughter was that she had no clear way of reaching out to Jesus on her own. She had no clear way of expressing any faith. She was lying in her bed, a golden child, on the cusp of a life full of promise, but she was dying. The second daughter. What to even say? The phrase, hanging by a thread, is the best phrase that I can gather to sum her up. But those words hardly feel like they capture her life. At the same time that the first daughter was born to Jairus, 12 years earlier, this no-name woman, the second daughter, began bleeding, and the bleeding never stopped. The early church writer and theologian Ephraim the Syrian says this. He says, The girl at 12 years old is about to die at an age when she would have entered womanhood, and a woman has been hemorrhaging for 12 years as long as the little girl had been alive. Jesus would have been 18 or 19 years old at the time that the bleeding began. This woman bled while Jesus celebrated his 20th birthday, his 21st birthday, his 25th birthday. She bled while Jairus and his wife celebrated their daughter's first words, first steps. She bled while their first daughter potty trained, while she picked flowers and had playdates and fun times with friends. She bled while Jesus made his way through his late 20s working with his hands. 12 years hanging by a thread. I'm told by Google that when it's all said and done, the average woman in North America will spend a little over six years of her life on her period, which might not be a fun fact. Whatever context you may or may not have for understanding that experience, double it. Instead of six years, this woman went through 12 years. And to make matters worse, condense that experience that's normally spread out over a lifetime, condense it so that there are no breaks, no down days, no down weeks, 12 straight years of bleeding. No breaks. This was in a world without aisle 21 at Fred Meyer. In today's modern world of medicine, Mayo Clinic tells us that abnormal uterine bleeding is a common condition with numerous causes. Medical providers look for polyps, adenomyosis, leomyoma, malignancy, coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial disorders, itrogenic, possibly uterine fibroids, and possibly something else not yet classified.
it feels overwhelming to consider the toll that this disease took on this woman's physical health, but we haven't even touched her emotional, social, spiritual, financial health. To bring Old Testament law to bear on this woman's experience, Leviticus 15 said that this woman was unclean, that anyone she touched, anything she sat on or laid on became unclean. People who touched her became unclean. They had to wash all their clothes and bathe with water. Any fabrics, any goods that touched her had to be washed. Leviticus 12 made it clear that her bleeding and being unclean meant that she wasn't allowed to touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary, which was probably already obvious, but it made it clear that she wasn't allowed at the local place of worship, the synagogue. Numbers 5 said that her community was to send her away, send her to live outside the camp. What does it do to your emotional health to be viewed as a walking pollution in your, in your community? Most of you know what it felt like to be quarantined during COVID for a week or two and to have people move away from you and not touch you and not want to get too close and avoid conversations and all of that. What would it do to your mental and emotional health if you had to live in that isolation for 12 years? What do you do when your disease is that you're unwanted by others? The Gospel of Mark tells us that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. What does it do to your sense of hope when you've exhausted every medical option and things have only become worse? How do you afford the daily hygiene items that you need and the food that you need when you've run out of money and there's literally nothing you can do to earn any income because any good or service that you might offer is going to be rejected and considered socially unclean. Nobody wants to buy it. Leviticus 15, the chapter of the Old Testament law that focuses on women bleeding, ends with this resounding note. It says, you must keep the Israelites separate from things that make them unclean, so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. How do you pray when you are the one viewed as defiling God's dwelling place? How do you pray when you have been banned from your community's house of prayer? How do you pray when you've grown up in a community that has interpreted illness as a punishment from God? How do you pray when you need a God whose own heart bleeds with compassion and care for your plight, but instead the scriptures tell you that God doesn't want you anywhere near him? because you'll defile his dwelling place. You wish with all your heart that you could change your condition, your body, your biology. You rack your brain to figure out what you're being punished for. You cry out to God, you confess, you rail at God, you do it all over and over and over. 12 years of tears and anguish, 12 years of isolation, outcast, unwanted, exhausted, hungry, afraid, uncomfortable, in poverty, at the very bottom of society. What do you do when you've completely fallen between the cracks and things are only getting worse and there's nobody to help? Are you beginning to see why my short description for this second daughter is hanging by a thread. When I say hanging by a thread, what I mean to say is that this woman came to possess a strength beyond anything that I possess. I don't know if I could hang by that thread. The story tells us that while Jesus was being crushed by the crowd, he stopped. Who touched me? Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. It seemed a silly question, even to Jesus' disciples. Did Jesus really not know who had touched him?
Or did Jesus ask this question because he saw deeper than anyone else? Luke has already told us twice that Jesus knew what people were thinking before they said anything. Luke 5.22, Luke 6.8, and as the story goes on, Jesus is going to do that same thing again. So if Jesus was seeing something hidden, something that nobody else was seeing, then why did Jesus ask this question? Who touched me? This second daughter, she was not supposed to be in the crowd at all. She wasn't supposed to be there jostling shoulders with other people, and if anyone discovered her in the crowd, they would all be enraged. She was unclean. Anyone she touched became unclean. She was a walking pollution. Jairus could come and he could throw himself at Jesus' feet, but this woman had no voice in her community. She could not speak for herself. She couldn't elbow her way through the crowd and throw herself at Jesus' feet. Her community would send her away. She could only try to poach a healing, steal a healing, reach out a hand, and possibly grab a thread of Jesus' garment as if that would do anything. The last thing this woman wanted to do was draw attention to herself, to be punished for breaking the law, touching a whole crowd of people, touching a holy man. The last thing she wanted to do was get thrown out of town. Why did Jesus ask, who touched me? Luke's gospel says, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at Jesus' feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Mark's gospel says she told him the whole story, the whole truth. Now, why does that matter? Take a look again at who was listening to her story. It is here that I need to tell you briefly about an aspect of synagogue education curriculum. So you remember how we said earlier that Jewish boys over the age of 10 began learning the oral law. It's called the, the Bet Talmud, the House of Learning. It later became known as the Mishnah. Well, that curriculum, the specifically the Mishnah, includes entire tractates focused on restrictions regarding menstruating women. It's called Nida. And guess whose job it was to oversee that education and make sure that everyone knew how to keep the purity laws? Guess whose job it was to make sure everyone knew that this someone like this no-name woman needed to stay well away from everyone. The person in charge of overseeing that was the synagogue president, the synagogue ruler, in this case, Jairus. And guess who had likely never been given a full hearing on the subject? Guess who had likely been shunned and shamed and rejected instead of ever being given a voice? this no-name woman. So why did Jesus ask, who touched me? This woman in this community needed much more than a physical healing. The healing that was needed was social, emotional, financial, and spiritual. This woman needed a restoration of purpose, significance, meaning, place in her world. She needed a healing of her community too. This woman needed to tell her whole story in the presence of all the people, not only because Jairus needed to hear it, but the entire community, the entire crowd needed to hear it. In what other situation would this community of people have ever stopped and actually listened to this woman tell her whole story? Can you imagine the emotions and the urgency surging through the crowd? Here this no-name woman has been dealing with this problem for 12 years, but Jairus' daughter might only have minutes to live. Come on, Jesus, get your priorities straight. If 
Jairus didn't need Jesus if his daughter was not the one dying. He could have shushed this woman and reprimanded her and sent her away. Who cared what Jesus said? But Jairus was really in a pickle because his daughter was dying and he needed Jesus. He couldn't afford to go correcting Jesus or getting into an argument with Jesus about the finer points of the law and what it said about bleeding women. This was the one scenario where he couldn't just silence this woman and shoo her away because he couldn't risk having Jesus say, I don't think I am coming to your house. How long did it take this woman to tell 12 years worth of story? Not only was this woman unclean, but this woman had openly defied God's law. She was not supposed to be in a crowded space like this, making everyone around her ritually unclean. You'd expect any good rabbi, any good teacher of the law to reprimand this woman for breaking God's law. Leviticus 12, Leviticus 15, Numbers 5. But instead, when this woman had finished telling her whole story, Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And Mark's Gospel adds, Be freed from your suffering. I wish I could be a fly on the wall, watching the eyes of the people in the community listening to this woman tell her whole story, and then hearing Jesus's surprising response. What was happening within their hearts while they were listening? Jesus called her daughter. That's the same word that Jairus kept using for the other life that was hanging in the balance. Daughter. In all the gospel accounts, there's only one woman who Jesus straight up calls daughter. And it's this woman. Her life hanging by a thread. Daughter. A word of familial affection and acceptance. This woman who had been a nobody was now a somebody. This woman who had been a walking pollution was now being celebrated for her faith and pronounced whole. Jesus was restoring her to her community and restoring her community to her. Jesus revealed a God whose dwelling place was not defiled by this woman's bleeding. In front of everyone, including Jairus, the synagogue president, Jesus affirmed this woman's actions of pushing through the crowds to get to Jesus, not as law-breaking, not as breaking ritual purity. He called her actions faith. Jesus saw what was hidden to everyone else. She had faced the possibility of being punished and thrown out of town for breaking the law and touching the crowd and touching a holy man in order to reach out to Jesus. She was a woman hanging by a thread, and that thread was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Go in peace. Bernard Ott says this about that word, peace. He says, Peace meant that there was no longer anything between her and anyone else. She could finally look Jesus in the eye and her neighbors in the eye, and there was nothing between them. This woman could begin rebuilding relationships. She had a shot at earning an income. She was given a place and an identity. Just as the second daughter was being restored from 12 years of suffering, someone came from Jairus' house. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And Jesus now invited Jairus to have the same faith that he had just praised the second daughter for. Don't be afraid. Just have faith and she will be healed. Reach out to Jesus beyond every social, emotional, religious, cultural, physical barrier.
Just have faith. Jesus saw Jairus' fear, and he didn't leave him there. He was willing to reach past whatever perceived barriers there were to touch Jairus' daughter, the first daughter. Numbers 19 verse 11 says, Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. Jesus took this child's hand, took her by the hand, and said, My child, get up. And her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. How can you not love Jesus? Jesus reveals a God who reaches rather than recoils. A God who touches humanity and makes them whole rather than becoming defiled by their mess. Jesus is interpreter and the fulfillment of all scripture. All scripture points to Jesus. Jesus reveals a God who places the same value on the life of the golden girl as the no-name woman hanging by a thread. He has the same desire for wholeness and life and peace. He reveals a God who sees deeper. Jesus sees both your fear and your faith in deeper ways than anyone else around you. And he doesn't talk down to you. He praises you. He supports you. And he calls you deeper. He sees the places where you're giving it your all, but you're still a mess. He sees the places where others might try to ridicule you or quote verses at you or reject you altogether. But he sees your faith hidden to everyone else. He celebrates your faith and he calls you onward into wholeness. He sees the places where your history, your biology, your situation, your society have incapacitated you and you cannot reach any farther than this. Jesus sees the parts of you that need healing and care, the parts that nobody else sees. He sees the situations where you will never be healed until your community is healed. He sees when your finances need healing, your emotions, your image of God, your image of self. How can you not love Jesus? This is all the story that we are told. But just like a movie that ends too soon, I want to be a fly on the wall and watch more of the story unfold. On that next Sabbath, when Jairus, the president of the synagogue, looked out at the people of the community, all gathered for prayers and reading scripture, I want to know what was happening inside of Jairus' heart as he locked eyes with the woman who he previously would have ran out of the synagogue. This woman who Jesus had called daughter. This woman whose story the entire community now had to face and whose faith Jesus had praised. I want to see what was in Jairus' eyes as he looked at her and as he looked at this community. Was it humility? Was it a recognition that this woman possessed a kind of faith that ran deeper than any suffering he'd ever known and that towered far above the heights of his intellect? What did having deeper faith mean to Jairus now that it hadn't meant last week? Was the look in Jairus' eyes a new compassion? Was Jairus looking out wondering who else in the community might have a story of suffering that he had not yet heard, but might be reaching towards Jesus all the same? What was happening in Jairus' heart as he looked out at all the boys, 10 years old and over, whose education he was overseeing that year? How could he help these boys see the women of this community in the same way Jesus saw them. I want to be a fly on the wall and see the no-name woman, the second daughter. I want to see her eyes as she looked around the synagogue at the many people there who were gathered to pray. The, these people who had spent 12 years rejecting her at some level, 
the doctors who were there who had tried but failed her, Jairus, who had likely not allowed her to be in this worship space. What kind of healing was needed in her heart? And what kind of healing was happening? What kind of forgiveness as they worshiped together? Was Jairus ever able to look at her and to say in any way, I'm so sorry. And could the second daughter find it within herself to look back and say, I'm okay. I forgive you. Be well. I want to see the first conversation between Jairus' 12-year-old daughter and the second daughter who had bled for 12 years. I want to see that conversation as they recounted the day that both their lives hung in the balance, the day that Jesus had restored their lives and called them my daughter, my child. I want to see the bond that was forged between these two women who came from such different places in life and who together embodied the God who meets everyone where they are and reaches and loves and heals and saves. Jesus is still reaching in love to the golden children and the people hanging by a thread, these people of Tillamook County. A tale of 12 years, a tale of two daughters. There's only one reflection question today, and the way that we did this in our worship gathering was to let each person choose the question that touches them, touches what the Spirit is saying to them the most. Here are the questions. What about this story causes you to love Jesus even more? How do you relate to the golden child or Jairus or the woman hanging by a thread? If you witnessed these events firsthand in your community, how do you think they would change you? In what way would they inspire you or free you to live differently? Thank you for joining us for a Sunday sermon from Neatart's Friends Church. We hope you'll join us soon for one of our in-person worship gatherings. For more information, hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. God's peace be with you, friends.